Let us pray. Lord, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Almighty God, who in thy wisdom and goodness has appointed the office of rulers and parliaments for the welfare of society and the just government of men, we beseech thee to behold with thy abundant favor us thy servants whom thou hast been pleased to call to the performance of important trust in these islands. Let thy blessing descend upon us here assembled and grant that we may treat and consider all matters that shall come under our deliberation in so just and faithful a manner as to promote thy honor and glory and to advance the peace, prosperity, and welfare of these islands and of, who, of those whose interest thou hast committed to our charge. And this we beg for Jesus Christ's sake. Amen. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Good morning, members. Confirmation of minutes. Members, the minutes of the 6th of March have been circulated. Are there any corrections or missions? There are none. The minutes will be confirmed as printed. Messages from the governor. There are none. Announcements by the speaker. There are none this morning. Messages from the Senate. There are none. Papers and other communications to the House. There is one paper to be communicated this morning in the name of the Minister of Education. Minister. Good morning, Mr. Speaker. Good morning. Mr. Speaker, I have the honor to attach and submit for the information of the Honorable House of Assembly the following. Bermuda Educator Council Exemptions 2018 to 2019 School Year Amendment Order 2019 made by the Minister Responsible for Education acting on the advice of the Exemption Committee on the Sections 5 and 23 of the Bermuda Education Educators Council Act 2002. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, uh, Minister. Statements by Ministers. Uh, there is one this morning from the Minister of Health. Minister. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Good Speaker, morning. today I stand before this Honorable House to provide an update on developments in improving the safety and enhancing the learning space of our infants and toddlers. Mr. Speaker, I rose in November 2017 to announce the publication of our very first set of child care standards for Bermuda. The goal of these standards was to support persons caring for our young children, increase understanding for parents of quality care, and to harmonize the work of all government agencies and private entities dedicated to the caring of our children. I am pleased to report that these were updated in 2018 and opened the door for improved oversight of our child care settings. Mr. Speaker, since the introduction of the standards, the Ministry of Health began to review the review of our processes and procedures to ensure enforcement of the standards, as well as the 1998 Children's Act and the 1999 Daycare Center regulations. And this is the legislation overseeing specific child care settings. Last year, Mr. Speaker, we amended the legislation to streamline the regulatory framework, ensuring authority over daycare and the administration of the daycare legislation fell within the Ministry of Health. These small legislative changes make huge steps towards aligning accountability and ensuring enforceability of existing laws. Mr. Speaker, the legislation is only a good, as good as the policies, procedures, and manpower put in place to utilize it. Enforcement of this legislation has included in the past mainly inspections by our environmental health officers and periodic audits of the personnel in the daycare settings. 
Mr. Speaker, recognizing the importance of our daycare settings, we also transferred a project manager to the area to review and ultimately reset the child care oversight system. The presently regulated daycare center sector comprises only two setting types, daycare centers and home daycares. Even so, it is both a sizable and crucial environment for development. It is estimated that nine out of every 10 children in Bermuda are cared for in a daycare setting at some time in their first four years of life. This is indeed a matter that affects us all. There are more than 45 daycare centers and nearly 60 home daycare providers in Bermuda. These settings are licensed or registered annually, and this includes an inspection by our environmental health officers to assure a safe physical environment, including but not limited to ensuring the water is clean, the home or center has proper place surfacing, and there are appropriate staff for the children in attendance. Following the inspection, the center or the provider must also submit an application form and supporting documentation, such as a fire certificate, liability insurance, and staff applications, educational qualifications, CPR, and other staffing documents. The volume of the information to collect, vet, and review is significant and requires knowledgeable staff resources to overview. The current review and reset are helping us to assess the level of dedicated resources that will be needed permanently to provide proper oversight of this sector. Mr. Speaker, we take the safety and development of our children extremely seriously, which is why we have dedicated our resources to this area. It is also why the ministry is appealing to our parents to help us. We need to hear parents' concerns about the care of their children. Problems with a daycare center or home will be handled confidentially. While we would like to, we cannot be at every daycare center every day, but as parents, you are, and you can be our eyes and ears every day. Not only should you expect better care, but you can ensure that your home care daycare providers are registered and the daycare centers are licensed by the Ministry of Health. If they are not registered, or a daycare center is not licensed, there will be no way for us to assure a level of quality in the environment and that the persons caring for your children. Licensed centers and registered home providers are listed on our website at gov.bm. Finally, Mr. Speaker, as has been reported in the media, the ministry has been handling a PADI request to release a number of documents concerning daycare centers and home daycare providers. It makes sense, of course, our inspections provide one piece of oversight of setting where our children spend the bulk of their day. We absolutely understand the public's interest in getting the full picture, but Mr. Speaker, we need to be clear about the full process to ensure there is context with the documentation. As mentioned previously, Mr. Speaker, the inspections cover everything from the water, fire certificate, ratios of teachers to children, and qualifications of the teachers. It is an enormous job, and the inspectors have to play both the regulatory and the supporting role. During these inspections, the officers use their reports not only to document requirements and shortcomings, but also to make recommendations and note follow-ups required. The inspection documents are not crafted notes. They are points in time at a center or home, which follow up sometimes occurring by email or phone. The point is, Mr. Speaker, inspection forms will often only tell one part of the story and not provide the outcome of the recommendations made. We are constantly working to ensure compliance. Some of the documents that have been requested require us to secure the consent of the affected parties, and we are in the process of writing to the centers and home providers to seek this consent. Mr. Speaker, unlike a restaurant or a hair salon, we cannot just close the daycare center or home care home daycare unless there is an immediate risk to children. Short of this, the impact on working families would be crippling. We constantly have to work with these settings to ensure compliance and best standards. If we were to shut a daycare, the reasons must be imminent risk to children's health and safety. This is the same standard used in other jurisdictions. Our parents need the support of their daycare and children need the consistency. We are always striking that balance. Mr. Speaker, as I said in 2017, our work is never done when it comes to the children of Bermuda. That is why, once we have reset the oversight of our current daycare settings, the ministry will look to regulate other high-risk settings for children, such as camps, 
after and before school care, overnight and weekend care services as well. It is appropriate for consistency and to ensure the best care and oversight for our children, to expand the scope of the oversight of child care in this way and to garner resources to perform this function well. We are aware of the issues that may occur in these settings and for too long there has only been voluntary compliance with policies. Mr. Speaker, to finish, the Ministry of Health continues to put our children at the forefront of our work in daycare settings. We know there is much work to be done, and I hope this update can serve as a rallying call to everyone involved in these settings, staff, owners, parents, daycare providers, for us all to come together to help raise the standards in the care of our children. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. There are no further statements this morning. Reports of committee. There are none. <coughs> Premier, Premier's questions. Members, today is the second Friday of the month, which is the day that we'll hold Premier's questions on our order paper. Just to give us a few uh, guidelines, to remind people of the guidelines, the guidelines for Premier's question, a question to the Premier shall be asked without argument or opinion and shall not address more than one matter of general government policy. Members wishing to ask questions should inform the Speaker before the sitting begins. I have been informed by members, and I do have a list. The Speaker will comply, compile a list, which I just indicated, and the Speaker will extend courtesy to the Leader of the Opposition to put his question first. And just as a final uh, guideline on that, the opposition leader may ask three questions. Other members may ask one question only, and only members asking questions may be afforded two supplementary questions. So to begin with, and remember the timeline on this is 30 minutes. And to begin, we'll ask the leader of the opposition, would you like to put your questions at this point? Yes. Uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, Bermuda, uh, Mr. Speaker, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, and for this opportunity, thank you to the Premier as well. Um, taking into consideration uh, the municipalities, and I recognize that we do have legislation coming, uh, but these questions are really uh, proposed to the Premier in light of the recent meetings that were had. Um, <clears throat> considering the results of the recent meetings held with stakeholders, of our corporations, does the Premier feel there may be need uh, to adjust its approach and measures to making them quangos, considering uh, some of the reflection that has been given thus far? Thank you. Premier? Uh, good morning, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I thank you uh, very much uh, for the uh, introduction of the rules. And from this perspective, I also want to take this opportunity to wish all the women of Bermuda a very happy International Women's Day. Uh, reg regarding Thank you. I see that a lot of members are wearing purple. Let's, a, let's answer questions, sir. Let's answer questions. We'll most, questions. most happily do so. Mr. Speaker, in regards to the question of which came from the Leader of the Opposition, uh, the feedback that has been taking place throughout this process of the conversion of the uh, corporations uh, to Quangos has been uh, robust. But I think what must be remembered is that there was a statement in this House last year by the minister who used to have responsibility for the municipalities. There was consultation in town hall meetings, which took place in 2018. Uh, there was a pledge to release a consultation document, which was released. There was feedback from that consultation document. There was um, initial town hall meetings. And then, and then also, there was the bill that is being tabled and debated, So, and is due to be debated. We believe that we have uh, made uh, the requisite need uh, for consultation throughout this process. But I think what's important, Mr. Speaker, is to remember precisely what the Deputy uh, Premier has stated on numerous occasions, is that this change is being made in the best interest of Bermuda. There is no, unlike the headline said today, dissolutions of any corporations. They are transferring to Quangos to streamline the decision-making process and to ensure that we can have unified approaches to major infrastructure challenges that this country has. If we are going to move into the, if we are going to continue to advance, if we're going to have economic development, we cannot have multiple sewage systems, we cannot have multiple water systems, we cannot have all these items. And though these things may be able to achieve underneath the current structure, the real question is, does it make sense to exist in an inefficient structure or should you move things to make things more efficient? We believe in efficiency and we hope ultimately that this measure will be supported by members opposite. 
Thank you, Premier. Would you like to put a second question or supplementary? Supplementary. supplementary? Uh, sorry, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, bearing the, all, all of that in mind, uh, can the Premier tell us what he believed to be the difference in concerns between St. George's stakeholders and Hamilton stakeholders, myself having been to uh, one of those meetings, I recognize uh, there was a stark difference in uh, concerns. Premier? Uh, I thank the uh, Honorable Member for his question. I did not um, attend the St. George's Town Hall, um, and I have not been apprised of the full um, issues regarding the consultation. But on a broad level, the fact is that the, con the two corporations are two different corporations. Uh, the Corporation of St. George's um, is a largely residential place, whereas the City of Hamilton has far less residential persons and more commercial ratepayers. So from that perspective and for that uh, particular structure, I would, recommend, I would say that there are differences um, uh, in the concerns uh, from uh, the particular bodies uh, based upon the fact that there are two different corporations. But what's most important to recognize is, though there are two corporations, Mr. Speaker, there is one Municipalities Act. And in that one Municipalities Act, the changes which are being made are to make sure that we can effectively advance the interests of the municipalities in the most effective measure possible. We are not dissolving any corporations. We are not <laughs> causing a new solution. What we are doing is we are changing it to a model which we believe can make sure that the items which need to be done in the national interest can be promoted in a lot more efficient fashion. Thank you. Second question or supplementary? Sup supplementary. Uh, I appreciate the, uh, the Premier's uh, um, short speech on, on, on that. Uh, uh, I'm quite surprised that the, um, he's not aware of, in totality, the concerns of, uh, with St. George's, uh, knowing that that was pretty much one of the first meetings that uh, uh, was had. So I, hopefully he will become apprised of the concerns that they had. I heard them clearly. Um, so taking, taking that into consideration, um, Knowing the stark differences between uh, the two responses of the corporations, uh, how will this one piece of legislation then take into consideration those differences, uh, considering that they are quite uh, drastically different? Thank you. Premier? Thank you, Mr. Uh, Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the legislation before us is the, uh, the amendments to the Municipalities Act. The question was asked regarding the feedback from the individual corporations. I told the Honorable uh, Opposition Leader that I did not attend the meetings. But I can assure you that there have been robust discussions from the members inside of my caucus who are the persons who represent there, and they are representing their issues and their constituents valiantly. What I can say is the government is determined to make the changes which are necessary for the 21st century to deliver for the corporations and to make sure that we have a streamlined decision-making process that takes into account the fact that there are national issues at play in these particular instances. There are the questions as to what takes place in the Corporation of St. George's. There are the questions as to what takes place in the Corporation of Hamilton. But what is really at issue here is how do we have a model that best advances the interests of those persons taking into account the national interest. That is what we are doing in this particular process. We believe that the Municipalities Act, as it's laid down, accounts for um, feedback from members in making sure that persons uh, uh, from the community are representing their particular interests, and we are confident that the government will deliver on that, and not only deliver on changes to the municipality structure, but also ensure that it works better for the residents that are there. That is the objective. This is about making sure that we can deliver better for them, and that is what the government will be judged on. Thank you. Would you like to put your second question now? Thank, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Premier. Um, yes, yeah, second, second question. Uh, considering that we just recently had on, uh, I believe it was Monday, a demonstration, um, and part of that demonstration had to do with the recent conviction of a pedophile, what was the main message uh, and concerns that... Was it Friday? Sorry, thank you for the correction. Friday. Uh, what was the main concerns uh, that the demonstrators had? Thank you. Premier? Uh, Mr. Speaker, I believe that that might be a matter of the public record. I think that Ms. Uh, 1A Crockwell led it was speaking about uh, the issues in their view of the inadequacy of, of sentencing and other particular items. So I think that is a matter for the public record. Supplementary? 
Yes, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, bearing that in mind, then, um, has any discussions been had since uh, the demonstration uh, or any thoughts further uh, to the next steps concerning those uh, uh, grave concerns that they have? Premier? Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, um, as uh, a number of my uh, caucus colleagues, um, and I think even a few members from the opposition went to greet uh, the persons who were gathered uh, at Parliament one week ago. Uh, during those conversations, and I think I made a, uh, a statement or I told uh, persons precisely the issue, and I said that they, she would be meeting uh, with the Attorney General. I can confirm that she did meet with the Attorney General this week, and there is a follow-up meeting that is scheduled um, on that particular matter uh, with the group of persons so the Attorney General can further hear uh, the concerns and have any consideration for any additional changes. However, Mr. Speaker, I have to make it clear at this point in time. This government is the first government that has issued public notifications for the release of sex offenders when they're released from prison. This, this government has already delivered, following the Joint Select Committee's report and recommendation, a register of sex offenders. This the government has made changes to the, uh, the treatment that happens, mandatory treatment inside of prisons, and also mandatory monitoring for persons who are newly convicted. So, and these are the things of which I expressed to Ms. Winnie Crockwell, some of those things that she was not aware of. And it's important, but this is an important part of our democracy. But it is important to remember and to understand that we have made upgrades to the regime following the feedback which came from the Joint Select Committee, which was impaneled by this House, Mr. Speaker, and those changes have been made, and those changes will be in effect going forward. That is something that we've done. We can work collaboratively on these issues. I think in this entire House, we can agree that our children and our citizens of this country should be protected. Okay. Supplementary or new question? Yeah, no. Um, new question. Okay, she's the last question, your yes. third question. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, bearing that in mind and in the, uh, uh, in the light of the last um, 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 vein of questions just being asked, I'm just curious to get an update uh, from the Premier as to why were the uh, children involved with the latest investigation into abuse within the Child and Family Services Department not interviewed? Hey, Premier? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the question from the Honorable Opposition Leader, but as the Honorable Opposition Leader, I would be a former Premier, and he would note that issues that deal with matters of discipline inside the public service are not within the boundaries of uh, the, uh, pub the pub political uh, representatives here, and those matters are handled exclusively by the established public service under Public Service Commission regulations. Thank you. Supplementary? Yes, yeah, supplementary. Uh, is the Premier aware um, of any other organizations that may be investigating or, or questioning the children that were involved in this particular situation? Premier? Is the question, am I aware of anything else that's going on? Just restate your question. Sure. Is the Premier aware of any other organizations, departments, uh, um, um, corporations or the likes uh, is he aware of anyone else or institutions that are, are investigating or questioning the kids involved in this particular uh, abuse situation? Premier. Mr. Speaker, at this time I am not aware. However, I undertake to ask the Attorney General, uh, who has responsibility for Department of Child and Family Services, and revert to the Minister. I think that on this one we do not have to uh, particularly play politics. We want to make sure that our children are protected and our children have the best standards of care, and I'm happy to work with the opposition leader to get whatever information that he requires. I may also suggest that this may be something uh, that our uh, newly impounded oversight committees may have a chance to take a look at, because I think that it's important that what we have in the structures of government, we are making sure that things are held uh, accountable and that we're doing things in the best interest of the citizens of whom we aim to protect. Thank you. That brings you close. Uh, well, supplementary. supplementary, okay. Supplementary. I uh, appreciate the uh, pre Premier's answer. Uh, in, in, the, in the light of what he just said, uh, Make playing politics, uh, certainly uh, I'm not playing any politics with this. This is a serious, uh, serious, serious uh, situation uh, as we read in the newspaper on a regular basis now. Well, that put, put a question, put a question like to him. Yeah, question. I just want to get a commitment uh, from the Premier that he will make this a priority uh, to address the issue um, because I'm concerned that there may be other cases coming forward. Thank you. Premier. Mr. Speaker, what I can say is that it is without question a priority for this government. Um, I will ask the Honorable Attorney General 
uh, to uh, have a conversation with the opposition leader so he can be fully apprised of the status. As I said, this is not something that needs to have a political divide. I think all of us here are united in what is in the best interest of the children of whom we serve, and I don't want it to become a political back and forth because it's a very serious issue. So I'm happy to um, extend uh, bipartisan uh, cooperation and communication on that, as I think it is particularly important, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. That brings a close to the uh, opposition leader's three questions. The next member who has a question would be the member from Constituency 10. Member Dunkley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Good morning to you, colleagues, and to those listening today. Question to the Honorable Premier. Last year, the Honorable Premier made a number of announcements in regarding MOUs that this government had in connection with FinTech. So the question to the Honorable Premier, can the Honorable Premier please update on the deliverables committed in these MOUs signed last year by Binance, Medici Ventures, and Shift? Thank you. Premier. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, regarding the issue of uh, the company Binance, uh, it is well known as part of the public record that Binance came to Bermuda with the intention of setting up their global compliance operations. But one of the things they could not get was banking services. They went to jurisdictions that could provide them banking services. Since this government has been able to deliver on banking services, now we have since been in contact with the principals of uh, Binance, and they have re-engaged with their legal counsel here and are moving forward with the application process throughout the Bermuda Monetary Authority. Um, so that's the first issue when it comes to Binance. On the issue of Medici Ventures, uh, conversations are ongoing with Medici Ventures in regarding what operations they will be looking to set up here um, in Bermuda. Specifically, I had conversations with Dr. Patrick Byrne, uh, who is the CEO. Um, of course, he's well known to Bermuda as his brother used to be the uh, chairman of the Board of Education of Bermuda, and those conversations are um, advancing. I think the other one that you asked, sorry, you the name three. You. Shift. Uh, thank you very much. Shift um, is uh, there was a conference call with the persons of Shift, uh, I think two days ago or yesterday, regarding their involvement. As members will be aware, Shift signed a joint venture agreement with uh, the local company, Trunomi, uh, to work to pilot Bermuda's EID system. I think you would have seen those type of things in the press. That matter is moving forward. They're looking to resolve. Uh, they're looking to move those items forward. Uh, we have uh, been, the cabinet has approved. Uh, I, an item to move forward on that particular issue, and we're awaiting just some final confirmations before those things can be advanced. What I can say, Mr. Speaker, is that there is a fourth MOU uh, that was also signed. That was with uh, the company Omega One, which is um, a digital asset exchange. Uh, Omega One uh, has uh, Omega One um, has applied to the Bermuda Monetary Authority for a digital asset business license and has received a approval for a digital asset business license. And we are, they are scheduled to be on island to pick up their digital asset business license next week and to hold a press conference with the government. So this is excellent news as things are being progressed, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary? Yes, Mr. Speaker. I uh, thank the Honorable Premier for the answer. In regards to the MOU with uh, Binance, the Binance Holdings Limited committed, and it was item number three, they committed to, through the Binance Foundation, sponsor university-level training for Bermudians in blockchain technology and compliance in the amount up to $10 million. Question to the Honorable Premier, how much money has been spent to date? Premier. Mr. Speaker, uh, there has been no money contributed to the FinTech Development Fund. Uh, when there is money that is contributed to the FinTech Development Fund, I'll be the first one to come to this House to say so. I think what we have to remember, and I want colleagues to understand, that these MOUs were signed to make sure that we had a working relationship with companies of whom we are trying to attract and set up our presence and set up jobs Bermuda. When building a new industry, there are challenges. In this particular instance, the challenge is the issue of banking. It is something that the government is working assiduously on to fix. We are making progress in that particular area. Mm -hmm. As I have told the honorable member, we are still in constant communication, not only myself personally with the uh, head as the minister responsible uh, for um, economic development, in touch with the leadership of Binance. They are still committed to doing items in Bermuda once the banking issues are sorted. They are in touch with the new banks of which we have bank relations with, and we are hopeful that those matters will advance. I told the honorable member that we, those items are moving, and we look forward to progress in those sense. And I would expect and hope that the honorable member opposite will support these items as much as he wants to challenge them. 
Thank you. You second supplementary? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Colleagues will support good initiatives for Bermuda. The put, your, put your question. Put the your Honorable question. Premier referred to the FinTech Development Fund, which is not mentioned in item number three of the doables by Binance Holding. Um, so I ask the second supplementary to the Honorable Premier. Item number four says that Binance Labs will make up to five million available for investments in, in new Bermuda-based blockchain companies. Is that going to go through the FinTech Development Fund as well, or has that ha started to happen today? Premier? Mr. Speaker, I do not believe that those are items that are slated to go through the FinTech Development Fund. I think the FinTech Development Fund is very uh, clear. However, I think that the example of which we can see in other companies were Binance, the largest exchange by volume, now the eighth uh, most valuable coin um, in the, the uh, or uh, sorry, cryptocurrency in the world, um, and the infrastructure which they're building, you can see that Binance Labs is doing many things around the world. They are doing things in places of where they can get a banking relationship, Mr. Speaker. That was our challenge. It is unfortunate that that was a challenge, and it is unfortunate that Bermuda lost out on the opportunity at the early stages because our local banks were unwilling to come to the table to support this level of economic development. The government, through revisions to laws, through hard work, specifically of the persons in the FinTech business unit and Major uh, Wayne Smith, have secured banking relationships that we're continuing to work on, which will aid in the development of this industry. That is something that other countries had that Bermuda did not. It is a shame, it is unfortunate, but we are not going to cry over spilled milk. We are going to make sure that this works. That brings a close to the questions from the member from Constituency 10. The next member who indicated they have a question would be the member from Constituency 31. Uh, you passed. The next on the list would be the Deputy Premier. Um, de not, not, yes, Deputy Premier. Deputy Speaker. Deputy Speaker, I'm sorry. I put your name Deputy Speaker, I'm sorry. Deputy Speaker. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I certainly don't need that permission, Mr. Speaker. De Deputy Speaker, would you like to put your question? Yes, um, Mr. Speaker. Uh, um, uh, Mr. Premier, what percentage of Bermudians are working on the construction of the new air terminal? Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I think what is important to note is that this government, when it was elected, was elected on a mandate and a mantra to make sure that we put uh, Bermudians first. And I think that there were a lot of complaints as to the level of persons who may not, uh, who have been, who may have been on work permits uh, that were at the airport site. I can confirm that when we assume government that there was no existing requirement uh, for the percentage of the hiring of Bermudians in the project agreement, and since the Progressive Labor Party has responsibility for the Bermuda Airport Authority, which is now under the able leadership of the government whip, who's doing a phenomenal job there at the Bermuda Airport Authority, there is now an existing policy that requires Skyport to commit yeah. to having a workforce made up of no less than 65% Bermudians and provide opportunity and employment to all Bermudians. And this is what's important. Even Bermudians who have a past criminal record, Mr. Speaker. This is something that we made sure to accomplish, and that, Mr. Speaker, is how you build a better Bermuda while putting Bermudians first. Thank you. Deputy, any further questions? This, I mean, supplementary? No. We'll move on to the next. Member, the next member on the list is the member from Constituency 19. I'm a member, would you like to put your question? None? Okay. The next member would be the member from, and I don't see him in his seat, <coughs> number nine. Okay. Um, the Deputy Opposition Leader, would you like to put your question? No? Decline? Okay. The next member on the list would be the Honorable Member from Constituency Number 11. Would you like to put your question? Good morning. How are you doing, sir? Good morning. Mr. Speaker, I'm sure that the Honorable Members would have seen the considerable works on, I say considerable, works at King's Wharf and Dockyard. Can the Premier confirm 
that Bermuda engineers are managing that project and is largely on schedule and completion this spring before cruise ship season starts. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I thank the Honorable Member from Constituency Number 11 uh, for his question because we regularly get to hear the Honorable Member um, or read the Honorable Member espouse what it's like to make sure that we celebrate Bermudian excellence in this country. And I think that the entire country can be proud of the Bermuda excellence that is on display, which is taking place at King's Wharf. The Honorable Member is correct that there is significant progress that is taking place at King's Wharf. It is progressing well, and it is a source of considerable pride, not only to the Minister of Public Works, but to this entire government that the project is being led by Bermudian engineer Carmen Trott. And she is ably assisted by two other Bermudian engineers, including Austin Kenny and Tavia Butterfield on site. While weather will always play an important role in the factor of delivery of such projects, we are very optimistic that the work will be completed in time for this spring and the full swing of the current cruise ship season, Mr. Speaker. Would you like to put a supplementary? Oh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. The, thank you. The next member who has a question for you this morning, Premier, is the member from Constituency 22. The Honourable Member, would you like to put your question? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, as the House is aware, former Minister Michael Weeks uh, commenced an investigation at DCFS with a report that was due at the end of October of 2018. Uh, has this report been provided to the Premier, and has the Premier seen the report? Premier? Um, reports do not come on these particular instances to, to political officers. They go are handled inside of the public service. So the answer to your question is no. Supplementary. Supplementary. Is the Premier aware who it is at the Department of Internal Audit who is now carrying out the investigation at DCFS? Premier. My assumption would be it would be the head of the Department of uh, Internal Audit. Uh, I believe the public officer's name is Ms. Roseanne Foy. If it is not specifically her, I will get the specific information for the honorable member. Thanks. Second supplementary? Second supplementary and final. Uh, yes. Given the allegations that the complainants at DCFS were not interviewed as part of the report, would the Premier now support a call for an independent lawyer or judge to be appointed to handle this inquiry properly? Premier? Mr. Speaker, I'm happy to take uh, that particular item under advisement. I'm not prepared at this point in time to make any such commitment on the floor. As I talk to the op Honorable Opposition Leader, I will have him have a meeting with the Attorney General on this particular issue. As I said, this is something that I believe that we can work together on, and I believe that as this government has supported the, in, the additional oversight powers of this Parliament, I think it's something that is ideal for the oversight power of the committees to look at. I think that maybe the way that our oversight committees are structured may be broadened so that they can look at particular issues such as this, so that honorable members and backbenchers can be involved in these particular issues and handle them. I think that we have adequate um, uh, energy inside of this House uh, to look at those particular matters, and I think that we can all work together in a collaborative fashion to make sure that the interests of our children and the interests of our citizens who we are there to serve are best protected. Thank you. That brings us close to your questions, Member. The next member who has a, indicated to have a question for you, Premier, is the member from Constituency 20. Member, would you like to put your question? Good morning, Mr. Speaker, and good morning, Premier. Uh, my question is around um, a gazetted uh, PADI request uh, that has been published uh, between a contract that was made between the Department of Communication and Inter-Island Communications. Um, I would like to know what the total contract was for the 2018-2019 uh, relationship with Inter-Island uh, Communication. The PADI request only is showing a published itemized list of services, but I'd like to know what the total amount was for right. that. Premier? Uh, Mr. Speaker, I, I knew though, that setting orders are not going to require me to answer a question uh, that requires me to go with uh, full research on such a matter, so I can certainly undertake specifically to get that particular answer uh, back to the uh, person. What I would say, however, remember, is that the honorable, um, the honorable member, sorry, Mr. Speaker, um, the honorable member is incorrect. It is not a patty request. It is part of a patty disclosure. So there was no request. Contracts that exceed a value of, I think it's either 50000 have to be gazetted. 
Um, and so all things are done in a regular fashion and order. And I would also like to remind uh, members that the Public Access Information Act was the idea of a former Progressive Labor Party uh, premier. It was put into place under the former government and is continuing to provide this type of disclosure. I happen to believe, Mr. Speaker, that disclosure is healthy, and we will continue to make those disclosures and be held accountable uh, for these uh, for our particular actions. But what I can say, Mr. Speaker, is a fee-for-service contract, which was approved and blessed by the Office of Project Management and Procurement, and I'll be very happy to get the Honorable uh, Member the specifics of which she's requesting, and in her supplementary, she can be very specific. I'll make sure to uh, get those particular answers to her. Thank you. Supplementary, or you're fine? Yeah. And my, my, my supplementary would simply be that, yes, I look forward to the total amount of all of the itemized lists of all of the services for the, the duration of that contract, which to me is from 18 to 19. Thank you. Thank you. Next time, try putting a question. The next member, Premier, has a question for you is the member from Constituency 8. Honorable Member, would you like to put your question? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Premier. Um, the 2018 budget, um, it was indicated that the civil service would get a salary increase of 2.5% retroactive to April 1, 2017. In this year's budget, uh, we say that the, and I quote, operating, operating expenses, um, including the operating expenses, is a 2% salary increase award to some public offices. My question is, uh, can you differentiate why you have said some public offices will get 2% increase while others get 2.5 retroactively from last year? Thank you, Premier. Mr. Speaker, I'm a little bit uh, confused uh, by the question. Um, I know that negotiations are taking place between the unions. I know that there was a mandate that was laid down by the cabinet uh, for a 2% increase. I'm not certain off the top of my head which unions um, have accepted that. I know for a certain uh, that the Bermuda Public Services Union has done so. Um, and so I cannot speak certainly, but I'm happy to get the specific uh, answers as to the um, other uh, unions which have accepted uh, the uh, pay offer of increase which is under this government. However, Mr. Speaker, I must also take the opportunity to remind all persons who are listening that there was no increase Premier. for that public brings us to a close. the former government, Mr. Speaker. That brings us to a close of the 30 minutes allotted for the Premier's question. However, we still have 30 minutes on the clock for any other questions related to the statements this morning. And, in fact, there's one member who has indicated they'd like to put a question to the Minister regarding her statement this morning. And that question is also from the Member from Constituency 8. Member, would you like to put your question? Th thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I applaud the Minister for the progress that she's making in this speech. But I think what we need to also look out for, who are also key stakeholders in this industry, are the teachers and um, leaders in the schools. And I'm not certain that they have any representation, Mr. Speaker. Mm -hmm. uh, it has come to my attention that a number of schools are not paying our teachers payroll tax, health insurance, and social insurance. Um, and I'm wondering what can be done to help those teachers in the preschool space. Uh, Minister? Uh, yes, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Honorable Member for his question. However, the statement that I read does speak specifically to the standards, the child care standards of Bermuda, and no reference was made with respect to outstanding payroll tax and health insurance tax. So I believe that pursuant to the regulations as it relates to question time, so that question probably isn't appropriate because it doesn't uh, contain anything that's directly related to the ministerial statement that I gave this morning. Thank you. Would you like to put a supplementary question yeah. or a new question? I mean, uh, 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 a new question because I think that was off base. So just put a new question. Well, just, uh, okay, my supplementary. Okay, new question. New is, question, yes. We have to ensure that our teachers are committed and dedicated to delivery of world-class standards to these young people. And they can ill afford to have actions going on within the classroom setting because they're unhappy with their terms of employment. 
can we somehow, can the minister somehow, when she does an inspection of those schools or an ins inspection of the schools take place, that we look at those type of circumstances as well? Minister? Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, as I indicated in the statement, the inspections with respect to the child care centers and the um, uh, daycares deal with things like fire certificate, liability insurance, staff insure applications, and educational qualifications. Um, it, it doesn't relate to payroll and outstanding taxes. Obviously, it's a matter of law that payroll tax and health insurance need to be paid for, but I guess it's certainly something that we can make inquiries about. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. That brings us to a close of our question period this morning. We can move on. Written responses to parliamentary questions? The written questions, the response has been carried over to Monday. Congratulatory and or obituary speeches? Um, we recognize the Minister of Education. Th thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I ask that this house send condolences to the family of Henrietta Louise Jones, um, father of a good friend of mine, Marvin Grant, who passed away this week. Uh, but, uh, Mr. Speaker, I did get on my feet. Uh, it is with extreme sadness that I have to ask this house to send appropriate condolences as well as prayers to the family of Ms. Sakina Talbot. Ms. Sakina Talbot, Mr. Speaker, was um, passed away early this week at the age of 38, mm -hmm. leaving four children, three of whom are my niece and two nephews, um, ages ranging from 22 to 2. It's a sad day, Mr. Speaker, when you um, get a phone call to say that someone that you've known since um, his childhood has passed away at such, a, such an early age and, in fact, leaving behind um, uh, children such, such as this, Mr. Speaker. And I just ask that the House um, collectively send uh, condolences to our family, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Member. Um, we call on the opposition, the government whip, rather. <laughs> government whip, would you like to have, have the floor at this time? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I would like to, this house to send a yeah. letter of congratulations uh, to the Hartos Karate School. Um, I have to declare my interest, as that is my home dojo, um, the Harto, uh, <laughs> yeah, 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 the Harto dojo, and, um, and my sensei is actually the the uh, Sergeant of Arms here, uh, Sensei Arnold Allen. And this weekend, Mr. This weekend, Mr. Speaker, his, his leadership was, uh, let's say, put to the test, and he passed with flying colors through his students. Um, they, had the, uh, they, had the, the, they had a karate, the Invitational Karate Tournament at uh, Pembroke, Pembroke uh, School, Sunday School, on, Mon on Sunday, March 3rd. Uh, you had Lucas Frey, age nine, who got second place in fighting and third in kata. Jalea Johnston, age 10, second in form. She went to win the grand championship in form, second in fighting. Jemiah Johnson, age eight, second in forms. Mateo Cameron, age nine, <laughs> first in open forms. Uh, Samaya Hill, age five, first in forms, unopposed. And Althea Frey Sylvia, age eight, third in forms. And also uh, one, of my, uh, one of my instructors uh, and coaches, Sensei Tracy, who is a third, third degree black belt, um, and, assistants, and assistant Harry, uh, Chief, Harry O. Chief, instructor Kiyoshi Arnold E. Allen. And that's our Sergeant of Arms right there. Mm -hmm. now, uh, I, I did not partake. <laughs> <laughs> But, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker the, the, I would like to also have uh, the other judges and instructors, which are all local, uh, Charles Butterfield, Princeton Bailey, Garen Wilkinson, uh, John Doherty, Oscar Lightborn, Bobby Smith, David Simmons, Al Wharton, and Arnold E. Allen once again. And I just want to say that uh, I would like to say a pre-letter of congratulations to go to Arnold Allen, who's opening up his own dojo on Cubs Hill Road. Um, and that will be open uh, every, every day of the week. So anybody who would like to come and join, um, uh, feel free to come and join with us because it is helping our Come youth and join us, you say? So you're part of it as well? You, you, do, you do a little martial arts too? I, 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 <laughs> you do a little martial arts with? I, 
It's your dojo. <laughs> I, 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 that, that, is, that is my home dojo, Mr. Speaker. And that's why I say us, because we are a family. We do everything together. We work together. We train together. Uh, so once again, a letter of congratulations to the Heart of Karate School of Sinucus. And it's the home of Sinucus, Mr. Speaker, which I encourage you to come and, and take a lesson. And, and, and Thank you. <laughs> And you included the whole house in those remarks, Thank right? You include Thank the whole you. house. Um, the next honorable member that's on his feet is the honorable member commission. Honorable member, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I just wish uh, for the house to send condolences to the family of Ronald Norman Eugene Clark. Mr. Clark passed away the other day, and his, he's getting uh, buried today. I've been asked that uh, uh, to associate uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Terrell from constituency 26 uh, with uh, these condolences. Uh, he's the husband, Mr. Clark, of uh, Ms. Joan Clark, and they're of Middletown, so they're my constituents. I just want to say that Mr. Clark, for us who are over a certain age, was a stalwart of the Young Men's Social Club, uh, Bluebirds, as they rose to prominence during that late 1950s, early 60s period, and he was well known and respected within the sporting fraternity. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Member. And I want to recognize the Honorable Member from St. George's. She jumped up real quick that time. Honorable Member, you have the floor. Good morning, Mr. Speaker and listening audience. I was going to say the age was de facto, but I'm going to stop there. Well. I'd like to, come, first of all, congratulate the, um, the First Episcopal District African American Episcopal Church on their 133rd session of the um, annual conference. We started yesterday at the Southampton Princess Hotel. We, um, this is an annual event for the AME Churches in Bermuda, and we look forward to um, what their year of restoration brings for them and this island. I'd also like to um, say a very hearty thank you to the women parliamentarians today because there was a call for us to acknowledge International Women's Day today, and every woman in the chamber has on purple, which is the color for International Women's Day. <laughs> There are some men who have won the purple as well. I wasn't finished speaking. There are some men who have joined the fight with us women. I'm glad you clarified that piece because I saw some of the gentlemen in purple too. Yes, the, the gentlemen have won purple as well. But I just want to say thank you because we um, recognize that as women, we are continuing to fight for gender equality, parity, and all of those other things that women fight for. So the theme this year is um, hashtag balance for better. And what we're looking for is to do and be better. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member. And now I recognize the leader of the opposition. Honorable Member, you have the floor. Yeah, another St. George's person. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I unfortunately want to uh, add my sentiments to the um, passing of Sakina Talbot, mm -hmm. a young woman who I got to know uh, in business many years ago who uh, did some work for, for us in our business, uh, extremely smart, uh, entrepreneurial uh, young woman. Um, I also had the opportunity of seeing her uh, elder two sons grow up and see them in church, and to also uh, be there when uh, her four-year-old um, daughter was born mm. um, and uh, the blessing. Uh, it is truly a, a, a real loss to have a young woman like this uh, pass mm. away. Uh, and so to the family, we extend our condolences. And I know we said to the broader house we would uh, yes. do that. Mm -hmm. On a congratulatory note, I'd like to – I had the opportunity yesterday to uh, spend some time with P4 at uh, Purvis Primary. Um, and I want to congratulate them on the work that they're doing in understanding what, what it is that we do here in Parliament. Um, and so I was asked to answer some questions and the likes. Um, and so I want to congratulate and, and send out uh, a, a note of uh, support to the teachers, uh, Ms. Butterfield and Ms. Savory, uh, who are doing a fantastic job with this P4 group uh, in getting these young kids at eight years old, some were nine, to understand exactly what it is that we do in Parliament and to understand the system itself. They were quite knowledgeable, actually. Uh, mm -hmm. So we had a great time, and I want to congratulate them on the work and project that they are doing. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Honorable Member. Does any other member wish to speak? I, I recognize the Honorable Member Tyrrell. Honorable Member Tyrrell, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and good morning, all. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I would ask if this House could send a lot of condolences to the family of the uh, late Mr. Kelvin Bascom, uh, popularly known as Nancy. 
Bascom, who's a friend of, friend of a family. Uh, he will be sadly missed uh, by the rest of the family, uh, certainly myself, because he and I were members of the um, Warwick Workman's Club, and we got to play cards a lot uh, together at, at that establishment. Um, I'd like to associate uh, Honorable Cole Simons as well. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Honorable Member. Does any other Honorable Member wish? We recognize Honorable Member from Constituency 10. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'd like this Honorable House to send congratulations, and I'm sure all members of this uh, chamber will be associated with uh, the oh, congratulations good. to uh, Nikita Evans Robinson on her organization of World Book Day, which she does at many of the schools and preschools around the island. Uh, myself and many colleagues have had the opportunity to um, be invited and to read in the schools with our young children, and it is always a very uh, rewarding, fun, and interesting time. Yesterday, I was at the Happy Valley uh, preschool and got to relive some readings of my younger days of Jack and the Beanstalk. Mm -hmm. And I know, I think the premier was somewhere, the opposition leader, a number of people were. So congratulations to Ms. Robinson on organizing a wonderful event, which she does around her birthday. Mm -hmm. I'd like to take this opportunity just to, as uh, has been done by the honorable member from constituency number one, uh, to congratulate all the organizers in Bermuda of the International Day of the Women and for everyone for coming out and supporting it. Uh, it certainly is appropriate and brings recognitions to some of the opportunities that we still need to take advantage of here in Bermuda. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Honorable Member. And now I recognize the Minister of Works. Honorable Minister, Mr. you have Speaker. the floor. Mr. Speaker, thank you. I'd like to be associated with the congratulations to the Amy Church on the occasion mm -hmm. of their 133rd um, annual conference. I'd also like to um, congratulate the Honorable Minister of Tourism and Transport, mm -hmm. who actually gave the message last night as a lay, lay person mm. um, at the conference as a member of Vernon Temple AME Church. And I can say, Mr. Speaker, mm -hmm. we don't have to have any fear that he'll be joining the clergy, hmm. <laughs> even though he is a minister, he will remain as a minister of the government, even though he did do an admirable job as a, as a layman. I'd also like, Mr. Speaker, to extend congratulations and ask the House to do so, join me in doing so, um, to the Reverend Dr. Blanche Burchell, the pastor of Glory Temple in St. David's, a schoolmate of mine, who this weekend will be celebrating her 65th birthday. Mm -hmm. And I wish her the most hearty of congratulations. Thank you. Hey. Thank you, Honorable Member. Does any other member wish to speak? We recognize the Honorable Minister Fogo. Honorable Minister, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, firstly, I would like to give condolences for Mr. Leroy Trott, who was a constituent of mine and um, suffered many, many years from Ill illness. I would like to associate MP Renee Ming with these remarks. I'd also like to give condolences for Mrs. Bernard, a St. Georgian woman, a very unassuming, very quiet lady, but um, nonetheless made her mark in St. George's. Um, she will be missed dearly by her family, the Ming family, as well as the um, Bernard family. Um, I, oh, Mr. On a happier note, Mr. Speaker, I would like to give congratulations to Mr. Nathan Trott. Uh, Mr. Nathan Trott, I'd like to associate... Associate yourself, yes. Excuse me? They said it was done on... on, on okay, I'd like to associate yes. myself with the remarks for Nathan Trott. I wasn't here to give um, remarks on Wednesday past. Uh, Mr. Trott signed a new deal with West Ham United. Um, and he will be with that club until 2022. <laughs> Mr. Nathan Trott has, uh, has signed a new deal keeping the goalkeeper with the club until the time I stated, which is 2022. The 20 year old, year old has featured in 12 matches this season for the Irons, playing 10 times in the Premier League, two, and twice in the Chaka Trade Trophy. The Bermudian-born shot stopper first joined West Ham in January 2016 on the recommendation of the former Hammer, Clyde Best, and has regularly trained with the first team this current season. Mm -hmm. So, Mr. Speaker, kudos to him. Uh, that speaks well of our uh, football that's going on in Bermuda, and in spite of 
the fact that we don't have the type of money that gets put into football that other countries do. We still have a lot of very talented people here in Bermuda, and Nathan is one who, along with others, is speaking to that talent. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. No other member? A member from Constituency 11. Almost missed you that time. You have the floor. Good morning, Mr. Speaker. Good morning. I want to first see you on behalf of MP Tanae Furby and myself thank the class of P6 Williams and Ming who invited us down to Har Harrington Sound Primary School to explain. We thought we were going there to explain how legislation was passed mm -hmm. and we found out we had no blank to fill in. These children knew everything. Mm -hmm. we, what we did teach them... They, they about, learned, you learned a few things from them, eh? Yes, we did. Good. Um, we got to speak to them about the need for gender equality in mm -hmm. politics mm -hmm. um, because they knew the numbers of the number of MPs and the number of women to men, and they said, oh, we need more, more women in politics. On a sadder note, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to give condolences to the Benjamin family of Lawyer Hill on the passing of Mr. Roderick Benjamin. Was done. Um, you can associate yourself with that. That was done earlier. Oh, sorry. Yes. And uh, Mr. Wolf of Cedar Park. Some people would know him as Scuffler. He was a, how can I say, very vivid character in town. And unfortunately, he passed away. So I yeah. just want to give condolences to those families. I'll be added to that one too. I know the Thank family you. well. Thank All you. Right. Does any other member wish to speak? Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'm sure that I um, am late, so I'll ask just myself to be associated uh, to rise today and echo the sentiments of my colleagues to recognize International Women's Day. As was stated by the Honorable Member for Constituency Number uh, 2, this year's theme is Balance for Better, and each day thousands of women in Bermuda work hard maintaining the fabric of our community. They are our mothers, our sisters, our daughters, and our aunts. They are our teachers, our counselors, our leaders, our mentors, and our friends. And today we celebrate the light that the women of this country bring to our nation and thank you for the hard, unwavering investment they have made to make and continue to make uh, for Bermuda. And I will say, Mr. Speaker, that I know that I'll be joined by a number of members of this House to commemorate International Women's Day this lunchtime um, at the steps of City Hall. Thank you. That brings us to a close. Other condolences and congratulations. We'll move on. Matters of privilege. There are none. Personal explanation. There are none. Notice of motion for important matters. There are none. Introduction of bills. There are two government bills to be introduced today, and I believe they're both in the name of the Minister of <coughs> Finance. Minister. Good morning, Mr. Speaker. Good morning. I'm introduce introducing the following bill, which according to Section 36.3 of the Bermuda Constitution requires the Governor's recommendation so that it, it, can, it may be placed on the order paper for the next day of meeting. And that's the Payroll Tax Amendment Act of 2019. Speaker, I'm also introducing the following bill, uh, with, which according to Section 36.3 of the Bermuda Constitution requires the Governor's recommendation so that it may be placed on the order paper for the next day of meeting. And that's the Stamp Duties Amendment Act 2019. Thank you, Minister. Opposition bills? There are none. Private members' bills? There are none. Notice of motions? There are none. Orders of the day? Orders of the day. And again, for our listening public, we're here today to continue the budget debate to discuss the, in committee the supply of the estimates of revenues for the year 20. 19 and 2020, and this morning the first department up, or ministry up to be debated, is that of Home Affairs, and I would like to acknowledge the chairperson who will be in, Mr. Simons, will you take the chair, and we can proceed with the, the budget debate. I believe today, this morning is a two-hour allotment, and then this afternoon there is six hours allotment for the second head today, which is the, that of transport. But, Mr. Simons, you can take the chair. Thank you.
Good morning. Uh, at this time, we'd like to resume in the Committee of Supply. Uh, today, we are debating for two hours the Ministry um, of Energy, head number 89. And this debate will conclude at... We'll, we'll have a break at 12.30 and continue after lunch for a short period of time. I now recognize the Deputy Premier, the Honorable Walter Rubin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am moving Head 89, Energy, now to be taken under consideration. Mr. Chairman, I am pleased to present the budget head 89, the Department of Energy, found on pages B24 to B27, and C7 and C15 of the approved estimates in revenue and expenditure. The Department's mission, Mr. Chair, is summed up in a simple sentence. We develop public policy, public utility policy, and legislation which in enables secure energy electronic communications and broadcasting platforms for Bermuda. The subtle reference, the subtle difference from that which was published last year is that the Department of Energy has now assumed responsibility for telecommunications department, formerly head 46. And with that comes additional duties that need to be incorporated. Formal changes to the department are ongoing, but for now, this statement expresses the breadth of its responsibilities. Through this mission, I'm sorry, though this mission seems concise, the functions are many, re ranging from public outreach, education, and engagement, to the research and development of more sites for renewable energy, and reform of the long neglected industry sectors like broadcasting. Mr. Chairman, the total current expenditure of Head 89 is estimated to be $880,000 and represents an increase of 12% or $97,000 over the last year's figures. This primarily is due to the addition of one member of staff to the department's salary budget from the former Department of Telecommunications. Operating budgets have remained exactly the same of those of the preceding year. Mr. Chairman, advertising and promotion found on B325 on line five is allocated $50,000, which is used to host events such as the Energy Summit, and to fund public information campaigns around energy issues such as conservation and efficiency, solar energy, to name a few. Mr. Chairman, on page, page B325, line 6, shows the allocation for professional services, which includes consultant services and has been allocated a total of $335,000. Consultants are hired where there is no in-house expertise. Last year's consultants were hired for supporting in the ongoing negotiations and administration of the six megawatt solar development. The development of the fuels policy, which was approved in September 2018, and for the work toward broadcasting reform. Mr. Chairman, the manpower estimates for the Ministry of Headquarters, as outlined on page B25, are four full-time posts. This is an increase from three from the previous fiscal year. And the Department of Energy is in the process of combining its functions with those of the former Department of Telecommunications. This additional position is for one telecommunications officer. Output measures. The output measures for the Department of Energy are found on pages B, 
326 and B327 of the approved estimates of revenue and expenditure. I will now detail some of those measures and their outcomes. Mr. Chairman, the development of policy and legislation of fuels is part of a larger project that the Department is undertaking, namely to review and revise existing legislation governing the regulatory authority, how it functions and how best to improve those functions for an agile, responsive, streamlined and efficient regulatory environment. To ensure that any new legislation achieve these goals, it makes sense to develop framing legislation around the fuel sector in tandem with the work rather than compounding any issues that currently exist. Mr. Chairman, another project in tandem to the review and amendment of existing regulatory legislation is the completion of broadcasting reform. Over the past year, a great deal of work has been spent on examining possible policy changes. What is apparent is that technology has moved on and continues to progress at a pace that the current policies have not kept up with. Any new policies must be future-proofed as much as possible so that the goals of accessibility, quality, opportunity for Bermudian content providers and the like are preserved while allowing for technological advances like streaming and over-the-top services. Consulting services have been employed from time to time to help address this project. Mr. Chairman, public outreach and education around energy matters remains a priority. In this day and age where there are many sources of information online, it is difficult to parse good information from that which is spurious and promotes fear, distrust, and concern. The Department aims to promote the dissemination of good, reliable, accurate information to better enable the public to be in control of their energy use and expenditure. Mr. Chairman, the Department has also been representing government in overseeing the development of the solar PV project at the Old Munitions Pier, or commonly known as the Finger, adjacent to the Aleph Wade International Airport. While the capital budget for this work is outlined under section found on page C7, it bears mentioning that the additional resource for this project, namely its management, has been handled largely in-house by the department's expertise. This is a body of work quite separate from the trucking, hauling, and cutting of vegetation and demands due diligence and time on the part of the department's personnel. From time to time, it has been necessary to consult other experts, and part of the budget for consultants has been used in this area. Revenue. Mr. Chairman, the revenue summary for the Department of Energy can be found on page B325. These figures represent the government's authorization fees in the electronic communication sector and the new fees for those holding licenses in the electricity sector. Telecommunications is expected to take in approximately $15 million by the end of the fiscal year, and the newly licensed electricity sector will earn approximately $200,000 in revenue. Spectrum band fees are anticipated to earn approximately $2,480,000. In total, with various commercial fees and media, mass media fees, department revenue is projected to be about $17,885,000. Capital expenditures, Mr. Chairman. The capital development ex expenditure for the Department of Energy is found on page C7 of the approved estimates of revenue and expenditure. This amount, $200,000, represents part of the government's obligation to provide a site that is ready to develop the upcoming six megawatt solar photovoltaic project at the Old Munitions Pier of the Finger 
at the Elephant International Airport. This site, this site had for years been used as a catch-all area for all manner of items, from asphalt screenings, from the last resurfacing work of the runways to old fuel tanks, and as a neglected area, the vegetation became quite overgrown. The work of installing the panels is scheduled to commence within the next few months, and this will be Bermuda's first utility-scale renewable energy installation, which will benefit all ratepayers in the stabilization and possible reduction of energy costs. Mr. Chairman, the capital acquisitions budget for the Department of Energy is captured on page C-15 of the budget book under business unit 76689. The estimate for fiscal year 2019-20 is $250,000 and is to be used to fund the solar rebate initiative and other initiatives that increase the uptake of energy efficiency technologies. Mr. Chairman, an initiative beginning soon, also coming out of the budget, is the LED exchange program. Details are being designed, and the concept is that members of the public will be able to exchange an old incandescent bulb with an energy efficient LED and learn about the benefits of making the switch from energy efficient to more energy efficient technologies. This is an exciting venture because we are partnering with local vendors to implement this program. We will be announcing the start of the program and the participation participating vendors very soon. Now on to major achievements, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Major achievements, Mr. Chairman. The rebate program launched in October 2018 is designed to, be, to, be, to better support those at the lower end of the economic scale, rather than a simple reboot of the previous rebate initiatives on solar thermal and solar photovoltaic installations. This round of rebates favors those who might not otherwise make the investments in solar technologies. And so those owning homes with a lower a ARV, annual rental value, can receive up to $8,000 back when they invest in solar PV. The rebate benefit decreases as annual rental value increases so that residential scale solar development in general is still encouraged but rewarded less for those in larger high-value homes. To date, there has been a total of 22 kilowatt installed using this program. There are currently applications that are pending that represent a further 90 kilowatts. Mr. Chairman, recognizing that the rebate program still does not address the plight of those who are struggling to make ends meet, the department has begun a tripartite partnership with the Ministry of Public Works and the Bermuda Housing Corporation using, use, using some of the funds in this capital budget. Our partners are in the process of installing energy efficient technologies that are funded out of the same budget, such as LED light fixtures and timers to water heaters in the homes of senior citizens who are BHC clients bringing relief to those who are in the greatest need. Throughout the coming year, the Department and its partners will continue to work toward identifying and assisting those in need to move towards greater energy independence. Mr. Chairman, in November of 2018, the Department hosted an energy summit in observance of CARICOM's Energy Month. The keynote speaker was the former Prime Minister of Aruba, Mike Emmon, who gave an inspiring address about his leadership in Aruba's progress toward energy independence. The theme of the summit was 
toward a resilient Bermuda, with Bermudian and regional experts giving their perspectives on this timely and relevant subject. Among the panelists was Ms. Danae Hines, a Bermudian, mm -hmm. and who led a discussion on sustainability and the built environment. Mr. Wayne Smith, who moderated the panel on blockchain and its applications in the energy sector, and the Department of Energy owned acting policy analysts, an, an, analyst, sorry, Mr. Aran McKittrick, who chaired a panel on the six megawatt solar PV development adjacent to the Ellis Wade International Airport. Invited from overseas was Mr. J. Paul Morgan, the godfather of utility regulation in the Caribbean, Ms. Kathleen Riviere from the Organization of Caribbean Utility Regulators, Mr. Greg Paul, one of the world's leading blockchain experts from the University of Strathclyde. Honorable Member, can you um, guide me to which line you're speaking to, please? I'm speaking to uh, major achievements of the department. Mr. Chair, just allow me to identify it in the budget book. Do you still need further clarification? No, you're fine. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will, I will continue. Just on, I'm saying, the event was a success, bringing insight and knowledge to a diverse group of attendees, ranging from prospective participants in the energy sector, the local renewable energy industry, government officials, local engineers, and students from the Bermuda College. Mr. Chairman, the department worked to help develop the national fuels policy, which was approved by the government in August of 2018. Among the matters addressed were fuel quality, safety standards, critical infrastructure, and encouraging the use of lower carbon fuels in Bermuda. The fuels policy contemplates a framework to ensure that the needs of the customer continue to be met with expectations set and enshrined in licensure and regulations. And I can certainly state here, Mr. Chairman, that the goal for Bermuda for this government is to have a low carbon future. And the fuels policy, we believe, helps to bring that about. That will be good for Bermuda and good for everyone. Low carbon to zero carbon. As, ho as close as we can get to zero, we're looking to get. You have my support there. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, the department has worked to find ways to work within its budget and resources by leveraging relationships built through the attendance at conferences and symposia overseas. In October 2018, a memorandum of understanding was signed with the Rocky Mountain Institute to assist the department in accomplishing two main pieces of work. One was to help determine the best way forward to electrify our bus fleet, which is obviously the responsibility of the Ministry of Transport now, but then it was a responsibility that I had. And the other was to help identify other potential sites for renewable energy developments around Bermuda. The Rocky Mountain Institute, or RMI, is an independent nonpartisan nonprofit organization founded in 1982. In 2014, it merged with the Carbon War Room, founded by Richard Branson, as a leading think tank for renewable solutions and the battle of climate change. As part of its mandate, RMI a suite of, provides a suite of pro bono services to the island countries like Bermuda in an effort to ensure those most affected by climate change are positioned as best they can to adapt. The work of RMI is, is doing with the department, is, the work of RMI with the department is being carried out in partnership with other internal stakeholders such as the Ministry of Tourism and Transport and the Ministry for Public Works. Plans for the upcoming year, Mr. Chairman. Mm -hmm. In the upcoming year, the department 
will develop the legislation required to properly implement the fuels policy with a sensible implementation plan to ensure its regulation in all aspects and ensure that regulation is carried out by the appropriately equipped agency. Mr. Chairman, reviews and revisions of the Energy White Paper of 2011 will also commence. There will be consultation with the public and where necessary consultants engage to ensure that an updated version of this practical, workable, and implementable and, and will be implementable within a reasonable time frame and within existing budgets wherever possible. This is not to suggest that it will not embrace aspirations. It will, but now in the context of experience, and a more established regulatory environment. Mr. Chairman, the rebate initiative will continue in order to encourage the uptake of solar technologies with the easiest incentives we can offer, that is, cash back for capacity installed. This noted, the Department will continue to work with local businesses to refine and improve our approach so that more solar energy reaches those who can benefit from it the most. Mr. Chairman, the Department will continue its management of the site clearing of the finger and will maintain its position as a liaison between the solar developer and the Bermuda government. We look forward to having that utility scale project online and producing clean, affordable, renewable energy for Bermuda well before the end of the upcoming fiscal year. Mr. Chairman, the Department will continue its efforts with the electric vehicle subsector and continue to advocate for more for and find ways to increase the uptake of these type of vehicles in Bermuda. Rocky Mountain Institute will continue to work with the Department of Energy and the Minister of Tourism and Transport to explore the feasibility of electrifying Bermuda's bus fleet while providing advice and guidance on matters affecting electric vehicles for personal transport as well. Mr. Chairman, the Department will continue to work with RMI to identify opportunities for large-scale solar developments throughout Bermuda and working on ways to in for including ordinary investors to participate in our renewable future. High net worth investors will continue to provide the backbone of finances for utility-scale projects, but the Department is committed to finding ways for Bermudians to be included in the future of renewable energy in Bermuda. One of the things, Mr. Chairman, that we decided to do after discussions with the Premier and other ministers is that we decided to make sure that going forward, having had the experience with the solar PV project at the finger, mm -hmm. that any future projects of a commercial nature will have Bermudians first as the principal investors because mm -hmm. there are opportunities there and we believe that Bermudians should be first and have an opportunity, even if they partner with overseas um, persons, that they should be the first in line to take advantage of any further utility-scale um, energy projects going forward. Thank you, Minister. Mr. Chairman, the Department will be focusing more on education and outreach in a more constant ap approach rather than restricting its efforts in the annual energy summit. Rather restricting its efforts to the annual energy summit alone. The department will still be hosting summits, but it will instead move away from an annual summit to a biannual summit. This will allow resources to be used more judiciously with a better overall effect of reaching more into the community. Measures taken will range from radio talks, and advertisements to promotional events where the public can be more widely engaged in learning more about energy topics, especially about how they can take more control over their energy costs. Mr. Chairman, the coming year will also see the completion of broadcasting reform and the promulgation of a new policy for the broadcasting sector. Though this work has gone in fits and starts in the past, the Department is committed to completing the transition to a modern, efficient broadcasting sector, responses to the advances in technology. 
Mr. Chairman, the Department of Energy also has responsibility for space and satellite. In an effort to find ways to develop Bermuda's space and satellite sector, the Department has worked with overseas partners serving in the capacity of an advisory group. The goal is to identify improvements to be made in our policy and our legislation to enable Bermuda to be a competitive to be competitive in the satellite registration and eventually licensing similar to the shipping and aircraft registries, both of which are well established and well regarded. Mr. Chairman, in closing, I would like to thank the small and dedicated team in the Department of Energy, including Jean Nicolai, who is the director who is here in the chamber, Aaron McKittrick, Bernice Flood Gordon, Adrian Dill, and Patricia DeShields for all of their work, all of their very hard work. We look forward to working together with the public, with local industry, and the regulatory authority to support local businesses, local electricity expenditures, lowering, I'm sorry, lowering local electricity expenditures, attracting inward investment to our utility sectors, thereby helping create opportunity and equity for all Bermudians. Mr. Chairman, with this overview of the Department and activities, I move that the budget, I move to discussion of the, 19, of the Head 89 budget of the Department of Energy. Thank you. Thank you, M Minister Robin. Is there anyone else that would like to speak to Head 89, the Ministry of, sorry, the Department of Energy? I recognize the Deputy Leader of Opposition. You may proceed. Thank you. Um, Mr. Chair, one of the things I have to say is I always enjoy being across from the Deputy Premier because I don't know if it's whether it's fortunate or unfortunate, but he answers all my questions before I get to get up and ask my questions. <laughs> so, he has a very, so he has a very good, very good support team. Well, a point of information, I want to make clear there's no collusion between me and the Honorable Member. Uh, we do have a decent record relationship, but... Uh, you know, but that's about it. Thank you. I, I you think that, I think your deputy premier may have uh, he may have um, inherited Bob's crystal ball. <laughs> Let me at least declare my interest, if you don't mind, uh, Mr. Chairman. That the honourable member and I have known each other for many, many years. We go back long before we were in this. Uh, uh, chamber to, together as um, acquaintances. So, Thank you. Uh, in a professional way. Of <laughs> so, but uh, I'm glad that, uh, she, okay, she regards our relationship as positive and working together. So thank, thank you. you very much. Deputy Leader of Opposition, you may proceed. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I actually just have a few questions. Um, starting on page B324 under the Department Objectives, I note that one of the objectives is to continue educating the public on energy matters. We did have the Energy Summit in 2018. Are we looking to have another Energy Summit in 2019? And particularly with the, um, the RFPs that have been out to kind of um, provide some competition to Belco and find other forms of energy, and educating people about those things. I think that a lot of people hear about clean energy and saving money, but they really don't understand all of, I myself don't understand all of it and how it works. So I just wonder what other processes there will be to try to educate people about these things. Um, again, under uh, Department Objectives on page B324, my colleague Grant, former colleague Grant Gibbons last year spent two hours, I believe, talking about satellites and slots in space, and I'm not going to be able to do that. But I am pleased to see that uh, the minister is continuing to work on commercializing the assigned uh, satellite slots and that they are a potential revenue source, and we do need to be creative and looking at future revenue streams for the island. So I'm, I'm happy to see that. Um, Forgive me if I am repeating some of the things that you may have already addressed, Minister. On page B24, under uh, Head 89, Cost Center 99,000, in 2018-19, it was intended to have work, intensive work on reviewing the Regulatory Act 2011 and the Electricity Act, 
and work with the agenda, Attorney General's Chamber to draft fuel legislation. Where are we with those legislative amendments and when will we see them coming forth? On page B325 under professional services, there was a decrease in 2018-19 of 105,000 and this represented an increase um, in capacity for the department and a corresponding reduction in the need for consultants. However, this year the fees have almost doubled and I'd be interested to know what the reason is for that increase. Um, on page C15. Page C15. C15, yes. Cost center 76689, energy rebate, and, and the minister actually did talk about this. And um, my question was what the status of the project, but my, the allocation was originally 500 and it's gone down to 200,000 and I'd like to know why. I also know that in providing, um, this sort of income support for our seniors and for people who have homes that have lower ARVs. It will reduce their electricity costs, but the upfront cost of having the solar panels can be extremely expensive. And so how are we going to be able to manage that with people and how will be that, can we subsidize that? How are people going to be expected to kind of get these solar panels in place in order to be able to enjoy the reduced benefits? Um, in, let's see, on page B324, again, under 8901-99000 administration, the minister did talk about the fuels policy and, and the framing legislation, and we, I guess, anticipate seeing that proposed legislation hopefully before the end of 2019, and I'm glad to see that we are going to be able to see that because it's important that the fuel sector that is, is fairly regulated and that Bermudians can enjoy affordable, sustainable, safe, and secure um, delivery of their fuel. I know I find it really frustrating when I get a Belco bill and my Belco bill is $80 and then I have a fuel charge for $950. So, you know, I think it's ridiculous and I, and I don't know how that can be controlled or addressed. But if it could be, I'd like to see, I'd like to see that addressed. And, um, and on page B325, I note that the training um, budget has increased from one to five. So I'd like to know what kind of training that is, who's going on the training, um, is this ongoing, what kind of things will they be expected to, um, to be, are they conferences or, you know, what exactly is the training? And again, on page B325, under expenditure travel has also increased from four to ten. So I'd like to know what that increase is for. Uh, generally, the other the travel, yeah, it's gone from four to ten, and just wondering what that is comprised of, and who's doing the traveling, and is it related to the is it an associated cost with the training, um, and then materials and supplies on page B three twenty five again under expenditure has increased from two to nine, and I'd like to know what why that increased and what that increase is comprised of. Um, on B325, again, and under employee numbers, I note the position that's been added was for a telecommunications officer. What is their role? Was that an, is that a new post or was it one that had been um, just an unfunded vacancy or a funded vacancy that is just being filled or was it a totally new created post? On page B326, under performance measures, we were, it, the government was going to facilitate the procurement of an energy management or energy services company to assist with reduction of energy expenditure in government buildings. And that was a new measure for 2018-19. At, at that point, the original forecast was to have a service provider. That has now been changed so that an in-house energy manager position has been created instead, and I'd just like to know the reason for the change. I'm, you know, I'm happy if we found somebody in Bermuda that's actually able to do the job and we didn't have to go outside to have somebody to do it, but I would just like to know the reason why. And um, I think... That was... I think that's, those are all my questions for now. 
Um, yeah, I don't have it. Because most of the other things. Yeah. Those are my questions for now, Mr. Chair. Thank you for your contribution. I now recognize the opposition leader. Thank you, uh, Chair. Um, <clears throat> I as well appreciate the brief that um, that, that was given and uh, was heartening to hear that the goal uh, for, for Bermuda is a low carbon future. Um, that's uh, very admirable to hear that we are moving in that direction. Taken into consideration, um, as we've already seen in the paper, where we're looking at buses that are electric, um, it'd be great to hear a little more about maybe some of the other departments that we're already talking to. Maybe uh, if the uh, minister is aware of another particular department that has large numbers of vehicles, uh, whether or not they are actually having talks with these departments uh, are ongoing about how to facilitate them to becoming more energy efficient uh, as well. And maybe not just electrical, but how we can be uh, more efficient, period, uh, with our energy use uh, as far as our vehicles are concerned. And that would be monitoring uh, the miles that they travel, maybe choosing different routes and the likes, uh, all of those things, especially when we were looking at um, uh, trust collection. Uh, and figuring out whether or not we need to uh, look at different routes that would be more energy efficient uh, was one of those uh, measures. Um, I guess what I wanted to uh, hear uh, um, um, a little more about is whether or not the, this particular head, uh, the folks within this department, are they actually at the table when there are any internal upgrades uh, being taken? So if we're going to be upgrading a particular uh, department, uh, or a ministry, is this particular head and the people within this area uh, involved in that to make recommendations as far as how we can be more energy efficient? I know in the past um, <clears throat> recommendations have been made, but I'm not sure if those recommendations are actually coming from this head who really looks at this stuff uh, on a more microscopic level. Um, and if they're not within the uh, working within the uh, internal measures or, uh, of ensuring that all upgrades we make to our physical buildings and the likes. Um, it'd be nice to be able to have them in there. So I just want to know if whether or not they were at the table during those times. And I'm on uh, uh, B324, uh, Chair, if, if, you, if you will. Um, I also, with interest, was listening to, um, uh, on B324, uh, the commercialized uh, uh, Bermuda's assigned satellite slots. And it's always been rather interesting. It's one of these areas that Bermudans uh, for some reason, still still don't realize that we have a satellite out there. Uh, I'm curious as to what are some of the latest successes that we ha have had, uh, knowing that it's a uh, it's, it's an older satellite. What are some of those uh, recent successes uh, in sales that we might have had concerning the uh, satellite, um, our satellite that sits out there? Um, <clears throat> and then I was just curious uh, the uh, on B three two five under the. <coughs> employee numbers, um, uh, it was mentioned that the, the, the position was a telecommunications officer position. I wasn't sure if I got that correct or not. They, the actual person employee, that it, the title was a telecommunications officer. And the reason I'm asking that question is because if you turn over on B326, um, and um, my honorable colleague, a deputy uh, of, of the opposition, uh, mentioned a little here, uh, that there was a switchover from a service provider to a person. Um, under the target outcome, it says by quarter three of 19, uh, 2019, uh, 2020, that we would be hiring an energy manager. So is that an actual extra person that we're going to be bringing on in quarter three, in addition to the telecommunications uh, 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 officer that is listed here? And if so, it may have been good to reflect that there that we are looking at quarter three as well to bring on someone extra. Uh, if you just go up a little further from that performance measure on B326, just above it, uh, it says uh, facilitate the progress uh, of the solar PV project uh, on the finger at the L.F. Wade International Airport. And I, I think that's going to be a huge success. Uh, um, I think we're all really excited about uh, this actually happening. Uh, but under the performance measure where it says revised, it says site clearing taking longer than expected. 
Um, if the, if, if the uh, honorable member, our minister, if he could give us uh, uh, some details as to what might be causing the uh, delay um, and the site clearing there. I am very familiar from St. David's down there. I know that site. I used to go out there, and I probably shouldn't have. Uh, me and my buddies out in Lou Ponce, because uh, the, the water there, the beaches there were beautiful on that side. Just want to know if there were, um, uh, what might be causing the uh, delay, and obviously when I mean, there's projects like this here, there are going to be delays, um, and it would be nice to know so that the public is aware of what those delays might be. And does that delay, and will that delay, I see target outcome, is that taking into consideration the target outcome of the projected completion on or before quarter two of 2019-2020? Is that taken into consideration uh, with that target? I'm assuming so. I now recognize the honorable member from constituency number 10, former Premier Michael Dunkley. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I thank the honorable minister uh, for his brief. Um, just a couple of uh, questions before I get there, a comment. Um, obviously, alternate sources of energy are quite important, and this government and the That's former fine. government have been <laughs> committed to solar. We've seen many initiatives. Uh, the government has had a solar power um, panel initiative uh, with um, homeowners, and I just wanted to get a, an update on the uh, government, um, the Deputy Premier, on that initiative, how long it will go, how successful it has been. And the reason why I say that is because I think the more we talk about uh, alternative uses um, and a way of gathering energy, I think uh, the more people will, will tune into it. Um, I um, installed solar in my house about four or five years ago, Mr. Chairman, and I am very surprised, pleasantly surprised, at how effective it is. Um, even in uh, times when you think we don't, um, don't have as much sunlight as we normally get, and days are shorter. In fact, I was just looking on my phone. I can view um, the power that is, that is um, obtained from the sun on my phone, and in February of this year, my unit on my roof, the panels on my roofs, generated more power for my household than did in November, December, and January. So even with the shorter days, less days in February, and, and perhaps some overcastness, it still worked well. And so this is an opportunity, I think, that we should do everything we can to support. And I please that this government supports those initiatives because uh, solar energy is, is there for us uh, most of the year round. It's quite effective in Bermuda. The panels are becoming cheaper and cheaper. And so I would support the government in anything they can do. I just look for an update for people um, as they um, have supported that initiative. And um, I think it's, it's important that we keep it going. I'll move on from there slightly, Mr. Chairman. There's been, a, obviously, with the increased cost of living, there are a number of functions that drive that. The, obviously, the consumables we have to use. Um, the cost of health care, uh, the cost of goods imported to the island, but obviously it's been a government policy over uh, a number of years to levy a very healthy tax on uh, Belco and fuel. Uh, is the government still um, moving in that direction, or are there, um, Deputy Premier, are there um, other options that the government might be considering other than the fuel tax to allow um, some reduction in the cost of, of electricity? Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Member. Is there anyone else who wishes to make a contribution to the debate in regards to Head 89, the Department of Energy? I recognize the Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a question regarding the Integrated Resource Plan, and I'm not, and I would assume that it comes under administration, 99,000 on page B324. And I'd just like to know what the update is with the Integrated Resource Plan. I know that there were some um, RFPs that were out and just want to know where we are in the process. And um, I apologize for not knowing what head it should come under, um, but I'm assuming that it would be administration. Thank you. Uh, now, is there anyone else that would like to speak to head 89, the Department of Energy? No. I now recognize the Minister, the Honorable Walter Rubin, Deputy Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate the questions that have been posed by members as part of the debate. I'm happy to provide answers to 
to them. Anything I don't have, I undertake to provide them with in due course. Um, one of the major questions that came up was about education, and I that was posed by, I believe, the Honorable Deputy Opposition Leader. And on page 15 of my statement, I discussed that, and just I'll go back and repeat what I actually stated, that the department is focusing more on education, and which is why we've decided that we will not necessarily have the Energy Summit every year. You did ask about whether we we're going to move from an annual to a biannual. So we're going to spend a lot of time between the two years focusing on de deploying some of the ideas that these summits have generated and focusing on, as I, and I'll just re, um, I'll just reread what I did if, with your permission, Mr. Chairman, um, focusing more on education and outreach in a more constant approach rather than restricting efforts to the energy summit. The department will be hosting summits, but it will instead move away from the annual summit to the format of a biannual summit. This will allow resources to be used more judiciously with the better overall effect of reaching more of the community. Matters will be taken to launch a range of radio talks and advertisements and promotional events where the public can be widely engaged and to learn more about energy topics, especially those which can help them bring down their energy costs. So that's what we're going to be focusing on, um, as per I, in my statement on page 15 that I, in my presentation. And one of the things we did this year, Mr. Chairman, is that uh, this past year we actually had lunch and learn. And people will perhaps remember that those were advertised. That was part of the effort by the department to, be, to begin to provide information to the public about how about what's happening in the energy sector in Bermuda and some of the methods that they can use and what's being done to help them bring down their energy costs. So we, it's obvious that there are things that each individual can do to do that. And so that's going to be part of the education that we're going to be focused on. The LED program initiative that we spoke about is a part of that. Not just the exchange, but actually in the process of the exchange. We'll give people information as to how the LED ball will help them and mm -hmm. how can, can make a real difference in their daily energy um, usage. And frankly, they can see the impacts on their bill virtually immediately within a few billing cycles. Yes, those bulbs are a bit more expensive. Let's say, and I'll just kind of give a scenario. Let's say a incandescent is a dollar. You may find that an LED is about three dollars. That seems like a lot of money for some, but you, may, you will save that amount of money in the expenditure that you that you in in, the, in like difference over one or two billing cycles, I can almost virtually mm -hmm. say that will be the case. And many people who have already invested in LEDs can tell you that. Not only that, the LEDs where they let's just say an incandescent may last 12 months, LED lasts five years, four or five years. It lasts considerably longer. So it's a worthwhile investment. Yes. So those are some of the interesting uh, things that we're going to make sure more people in the country understand around energy, and uh, we're going to put more of our judicious uh, resources towards that. Thank you. I recognize the opposition leader. Thank Sorry, you. deputy opposition leader. Thank you. Just to ask a question for the lunch and learns, how well attended were they? Only because I attend a lot of lunch and learns just in my profession, and I find them to be actually really effective. And so I want to know how many people attended, and do you think that it had the intended result that you were expecting? Thank you. You may proceed. Mr. Chairman, yes. We had decent attendance. We would have liked to see more, but there were decent attendance. We had a lot of industry people come and interact with us because they seemed to be quite enthusiastic about talking to us, having not had perhaps that opportunity to pass. Those who have a keen interest in the industry as well as members of the public came. But we're going to look at other ways um, in the future and how we can do that, even possibly having similar lunch and learns in government for government departments. Uh, because government has its own issues of which it would like to see spending less on energy. Maybe for the House of Assembly members. Happy to look at that as well, <laughs> if we can, Mr. Chairman. But uh, let me move on and answer some of the questions. So, okay, so I hope that answers some of the questions of the members' office. Yes, Minister, you may public. proceed. So I'll proceed. Um, 
some of the other questions that came up, Mr. Chairman, had to do with the um, the uh, regulatory authority amendments and the fuels policy, and when the amendments to those are going to be deployed. As we said in our statement, the, those are part of the objectives for this year. There has been work that was already done with looking at the regulatory act, and the there's a body of legislation, Mr. Chairman, that deals with regulatory affairs, the RA Act, there is the Electronic Communications Act, and um, those are two of the pieces of major, and of this course, the broadcasting legislation as well. But um, the RA Act and, and, of course, the Electricity Act. Um, the RA Act and the EA Act were all passed in 2011-2012, and the Electricity Act was passed in 2016. It is very clear from the experience that I think perhaps of both governments, but certainly of this government, that there needs to be a thorough review of both of those bodies of legislation, and particularly the regulatory legislation, so that we can be continue to shape the regulatory authority in its work. The idea of when it was devised, and I certainly admit to having some involvement prior to the legislation was deployed for all of those, um, all of that by legislation, was that we would have a multi-purpose regulator that would be regulating a number of sectors, not just energy, not just telecommunications, but also other areas of regulations, perhaps water or fuel, which is actually an area that they will hopefully be taking over responsibility with the appropriate legislation drafted going forward. So it would need to be multidisciplinary, not just one sole industry. So we need to continue to evolve the legislation and work with the regulator to make sure that they have the appropriate resources, the legislative framework, and the capability to do that. So that project is a part of this year's work for 2019-2020. The fuels policy, which was passed last year, the appropriate legislation will also be developed this year on that as well. Um, the fuels policy is a public document, so anybody who hasn't seen it can go on to the government website and look at it. And if there's an, I, if there's a need to make it, I believe I thought it was tabled in the house. It may, if, if it, if it hasn't been, I will ensure and commit to making sure it is. I believe it was, in that, um, it does look to ensure that there is a particular class of fuels that are approved in Bermuda but also make sure that the infrastructure that maintains and um, contains those fuels is safe and is at the highest regulatory um, mm -hmm. standards, but also it contemplates that the country's future will be less carbon-oriented fuels. Right now, 90-plus percent of our fuel is developed from carbon-based sources, heavy fuel, oil, and, and other forms. We need to be moving forward away from that as a small country that is exporting millions and hundreds of millions of dollars out of the country in expenditure on fuel. Imagine what that money could do to, mm -hmm. with schools, with health care, with essential services that we need. That money could be kept here and in the pockets of Bermudians <laughs> so that they are, um, have more. So the idea and the vision of the government in that is to begin to push from a legislative standpoint, regulatory standpoint, and education standpoint, a cleaner future. And the fuels policy is a basis for doing that. We will work with the regulator, which I think anybody who reviews their legislation will see, that moving towards a cleaner energy future is actually mandated in the legislation of the regulatory authority, as well as the Electricity Act. So these are directions that we desire to take. And um, we do hope we'll have support in those steps as we go forward. Um, some of the other questions that were posed, Mr. Chairman, was um, how will certainly persons continue to benefit from the rebate program that has been deployed? And there was $500,000 uh, set aside in the last budget for that. And I'll go into that a little bit more, but it, it, um, in detail about the expenditure. 
But one of the things, Mr. Uh, Chairman, that we have tried to make sure with the rebate program, unlike its original rendition some years ago, is that it actually helps those who need the help. Um, and this is not to be disparaging against anyone, this comment, um, or any government, because there were two governments that would have had some oversight of this program. The previous administration did end it, the previous rendition, which is fine, is that uh, those who could afford PV installs were the greatest beneficiaries. Mm -hmm. And that's just how it turned out. In light of the situation in the country now where people are struggling to meet energy costs, it was our desire to show that the program focused on the people who could least have affordability of such costly installs. Mm -hmm. And I applaud all those in Bermuda who have had the ability to install those photovoltaic systems. Um, it is a great that they felt they had the insight and the certainly commitment to clean energy in their personal capacity that they made that investment. And we hope that those investments pay off for them because that means they're contributing just a bit to lowering the country's um, carbon, footprint, carbon footprint and a cleaner environment. Uh, so, but we want in the future, as we have devised with the program, which was a part of a previous throne speech commitment, that it would focus on those who need it most, which is why we partnered with also the Bermuda Housing Corporation and the Ministry of Public Works and even financial assistance to identify persons, particularly seniors, within their um, client base who can benefit from not only solar water heating and also uh, conservation efficiency technologies, which are fairly easily available to ensure that that is the focus of the rebate program. So, and it's our desire to continue that in the best way we can. There will be limited resources, but some of the expenditure has been committed towards that. I'll get more precise on the numbers going forward. Um, honorable member brought up an issue about the surcharge that's on the electricity bill. Yes, that is something that I think we all have to deal with because everybody has to be hooked up to Belco. Um, that's just how um, the system works. Perhaps there'll be changes to that in the future, but that is how um, the country operates and all persons who use electricity are confronted with, this, confronted with the fuel surcharge. We are looking and we're discussing that being, that being reviewed by the RA. That is within their jurisdiction as the official regulator of the energy sector. So we've talked about them perhaps doing a remodeling of it, looking at it and seeing if it perhaps needs to be changed. And they will discuss that with the power company. So we understand that there are people who, and I've heard many stories about people who say that their fuel surcharge was higher than their actual real expenditure on, 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 on electricity. So yeah, that is a concern and perhaps there, there does need to be a remodeling of it going forward and we're discussing that with the RA um, as they continue their uh, work with overseeing the fuel sector. Uh, on the honorable um, members, of course, asked about the issue of an energy manager in government. Um, and there is on, I believe, on page, on the output measures, there was discussion of the procurement of energy management or energy services company to assist in reduction of energy expenditure in government buildings. Uh, the direction of that has changed, and the, the government has decided to um, have an energy manager in-house rather than hiring an overseas company. Hmm. But that, will, that, is, that is a discussion that has been decided um, at the cabinet level, but also, but is now being formulated by working with public works and energy department. It may be, and I'm just uh, trying to give members an insight as to, as to what the direction is on this, and that it may be possibly that that will lie in the Ministry of Public Works for the obvious reason. They manage the government estate, and any deployment of any energy efficient measures for the government estate would be done by the Ministry for Public Works. But 
there's an ongoing discussion around that particular post, but the like decision has been to certainly deploy an energy manager. All the information that we got had is that if this had been done some time ago, there could have been considerable savings um, to the government if there had been a manager. So there's, there's no blame being cast here. It's just that, um, you know, we all understand what the cost of energy has been for the government. It has been an ongoing government responsibility for all governments. But, and I believe that there's been a commitment throughout the years to bring down that cost. So, but the decision is, is that an energy manager, specifically in government, to deploy um, measures to, that will assist with the lowering of energy expenditure of government is the best way forward. So that is the work that's going on right now. It has been decided that's the direction we'll go. And certainly I'll, myself or the minister upon which you're responsible for that position will report back to the House once those things have been put in place. Um, there was a question about the issue of the clearing of the vegetation um, down at the Solar Finger. Um, there has been some delay in that only because I think partially that it was, we were initially going to be partnering with Public Works in that process, but there, for different reasons, the decision was made between the Energy Department and them that we would have to get, um, and also with the company, um, um, Saturn Power, who is the uh, contractor for building and, and um, like facilitating energy, um, the solar finger, that, that we would get a local outside private contractor to handle that. So that is why, but there are other issues that have been had to be worked through with the company to, that has delayed, had some delay in the work being done, but it was, it is quite a substantial job. I think anybody who drives around that area who has familiarization with it, there's considerable vegetation and it's gonna take quite a bit of work to do it. So it's, we're making sure that the right team is in place. I believe a contractor has been retained, but that has been done, that's, that's been done, worked with the Saturn Power to coordinate that. So, but um, I will seek to get more information on that um, as I go along. But I'll just go on and continue to answer some of your questions. The, um, the an issue came up around the, I, the IRP, the Integrated Resource Plan, which is uh, a requirement of the Electricity Act. Um, it is a process coordinated by the regulatory authority, not by the government. It is really the RA's process in which they received an IRP from the licensed bulk generator um, and transmission and distributor, which is Belco, with a IRP. So they have provided an IRP. There's been a process that has been going on with that. There was a period of public consultation that went on that was actually extended to the end of last year um, to give more participation and a number of uh, submissions were made, all of which I believe you can find on the website. You can even see the IRP itself on the website of the, I, of the, um, of the RA and see the submissions. They have had some commercials publicly about, this, about the um, persons who gave, the, the groups that gave their, okay, their submissions. So there's been quite a bit of public um, activity. There was a group that did their own town halls about their energy plan as well. So there's quite, been quite a bit of activity. Now it's in the process of the RA itself reviewing and incorporating all that has been received into um, a submission, their, their proposal around the IRP. There's been no sight of the government of that as of yet. That is a matter for the RA. But clearly it is a great matter of public interest and we will make sure that uh, that 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 happens at the appropriate time. I can expect, and I, and I don't want to commit a date, because really that is the response to the RA, but through our own um, discussions with them around this, I believe that um, later this year, there will be a public submission of the finalization of it. Not close to the end of the year, but later, certainly um, on the other side of the budget session, it will be closer to being completed by the RA. Um, I'll now go on to answer some other questions. There was a question about training, um, in reference to conferences and um, conferences and symposium, and most are overseas and specialized training. That um, and some 
which are not available locally. So the travel is to get that training and attending conferences um, under the area that and training that our people cannot get yet. So that money has been to facilitate training overseas that cannot be received here by our team. Um, when it comes to the post, a question was asked about the post, um, the telecommunications officer. Um, that is not an additional new job. That is, we're absorbing the Department of Telecommunications into um, the, uh, the uh, ministry. So uh, where it sat somewhere else, it's just being absorbed in. So there's, there's just an additional post, and there's a post that's already in government where there is a actual person named Pastor Shields, very capable, who handles um, particularly a lot all the satellite filings and um, all the activity in that area, as well as other other telecoms matters. That is who is being absorbed into the department. That's a good segue because I just want to ask you a question. Do we have any um, additional spectrum inventory? Thank you for the question. Um, the matters pertaining to maximum spectrum are with the regulatory authority, that's not a matter that the government deals with directly. So the management and overseeing of the availability or um, issuing a spectrum is within their remit, not within that of mm -hmm. the department or in the government. Um, I think I answered the question about the energy manager already. Uh, let's see now. Um, When it comes to the um, solar finger and some questions may have been raised about investment in that and how that is benefiting the country, the, actually the developer is actively seeking um, local investors to be involved with them jointly with the project as well. Even though they've received the contract, they actually uh, have agreed and worked with the government on make, you know, interested parties that desire to invest with them in the on the, you know, with their project, they are happy to find ways to include local investment with them jointly in the project. So we're very pleased with that. Even though Urban Union wasn't the principal awardee, there's still an opportunity for them to get in. But as I told you, going forward with additional commercial renewable projects of a utility or commercial nature, it is desire of the government to see Bermudians being exclusively the main investors and the main facilitators. Even if they partner with somebody else, they will be the chief um, beneficiaries of any commercial level solar. So, yes, yeah. But there are a lot of eager um, persons now in the energy community that are very keen to see this happen. So as we develop more um, information around that, we will be engaging with them. And I look forward to seeing them being the chief investors in um, certain solar projects going forward. Um, I've already answered the question concerning the uh, summit and how we're going to deal with that. Um, I'll give some more information on review of legislation um, that we discussed about the RA, the EA Act, um, the, the ECA Act, and the Electricity Act. Um, some of the review has been completed, but it continues in the context that now there's a new chief executive of the RA. We're working with them closely. And we have identified many of the challenges. Um, the biggest are is the need to maintain transparency while um, achieving objectives. Uh, um, opportunities in the satellite industry. Um, that's a very interesting topic, and it's a topic that I have spent a bit, a little bit of my time focusing on since becoming minister. Uh, as um, the honorable opposition leader did state that Bermuda does have satellite slot, has had one for many, year and many years, and certainly under the previous administration, we did achieve of getting a satellite in the slot. That satellite is actually um, not owned by Bermuda, but it's owned by a joint venture between two companies, and it's called Bermuda Sat One, and mm -hmm. um, the company is, um, it's a joint venture between um, SES and a company called EchoStar, and so they are the ones who have the, um, they have the asset in our satellite slot. We continue to have discussions with them 
um, ongoing about the future of that. At the moment, Bermuda is not earning any revenue from that. That would have come from any of the services that were um, facilitated through the satellite. Um, going forward, because there's been ex there were there were two issues. There were a few issues that affected that. Some of that had to do with um, FCC regulation, which we had nothing to do with, which they prohibited um, non-American satellites from transmitting into North America. Even though our satellite slide is quite strategically placed, there was an on, ongoing mm -hmm. prohibition for that providing services within the United States. It obviously created some challenges for us. But there have been significant changes in the industry since this process started for Bermuda. And there are other services other than the direct TV and all of those broadcasting services. There are other commercial services that, that, that are actually um, where there is opportunities for, for Bermuda. One is in the provision of marine services and other types of services. So it's quite likely in the near future the operator, if they continue to want to have a satellite in our slot, and that could change, you know, because we could um, go with somebody else as a country if we decide. Uh, but their desire is to uh, is to what they call is to um, move that move that satellite out of our slot and put it on another satellite that can actually be providing those services, um, because the market has just changed so much now. So that's an issue. But so we're not so concerned about the FCC prohibition anymore because the other services can be global and be given to anywhere in the world. And there isn't a prohibition on the marine and other sort of um, geographic services of which are becoming much more of a commodity in the satellite industry. We are beginning to look at um, non-geostational industry of the commercial industry because there's been an, an expansion of the commercialization of the space industry now away from governments to private companies, more private companies that have non-geostationary satellites that are in lower orbits, that is where the new market that Bermuda is looking to go into. And we have the assistance of our advisory group to help us with that. And our advisory group is a made up with a very group of interesting people. It includes um, people from Bermuda. It also includes people from institutions like MIT. It includes also uh, persons from who have actually set up satellite companies in Bermuda who are happy to work on giving the government advice on how Bermuda can become a bigger player in the satellite industry. I'm very pleased with the work that's been done so far. We have people from the insurance industry, we have people from um, the satellite industry. We have all types, a mix of people, including, like I said, Bermudians who are actively engaged in things like artificial intelligence and machine learning on this advisory group who are interested in working with us. And so we're looking forward to some interesting activities over the next couple of years as a product of their advice to the government. So I hope that um, answers some of the questions of members around what we're doing in the satellite area. Um, reason for the increase in professional fees. Uh, there is really no increase. We hadn't used our entire allocation in 17-18, but that allocation hasn't changed from 17-18 to 19-20. Um, Energy rebate change, the question was around that. We won't utilize the 500K in one year. Um, the allocation allows us to spread it out over time so that we get much longer. Even if it was given one year, we've been allowed to spread it out so that we get a longer usage of that money. And perhaps it's also helpful for us so that we didn't have to go back to the finance minister this year with his very rigid uh, budget allocation. So uh, perhaps. Next year of that, if we need money, because we haven't taken any this year additional, we'll have money going forward. Because our desire is to continue to try and advance the rebate program as a way to advance education and interest in how people can find ways to lower their energy costs. So we're using the money for a number of ways to advance that. Um, More information about the process of um, rebates so that members know. The customer applies um, to participate. The department reviews their application and verifies their ARV. Um, and then it's then after the project is complete with 
their applications complete with planning permission, and then they've had, and then the and then the department pays after that. So we help them through the process. They go through planning process after they've obviously been approved by us, and then we pay the rebate thereafter. Um, I gave you some information on the fuel surcharge, but I have a little bit more information I can share with you. Um, the fuel charge can only be decreased, um, only be decreased um, if Belco's plant runs more efficiently. And if we can move to a more efficient and energy, energy, um, energy dense fuels. Another factor is our high, our high fuel charges is that on top of the cost, we have to pay heavily for transport. I think I've been noticing our fuel comes from thousands of miles away. Uh, particularly, it comes from the Gulf, the Gulf of uh, Mexico. So that's quite a bit away for the fuel, to, and that's just a natural cost for everything. Um, it costs a lot to get here, as well, and it's also a revenue stream for government. Um, and our taxes that we receive is around 32 million a year from fuel surcharges. But I think if you remember in, in the throne speech, we did commit to looking at taxes on fuel and to see if any changes in the taxes, how they are deployed, can bring down costs. We are still committed to that. That's obviously something that the Ministry of Finance is working on, but that is a part of the throne speech objective, and we'll keep you up to date on the progress on that. Um, just a little bit more information on the reason for delay in the site clearing. Um, the reason for delay is the department is working with the developer and there were certain compliance issues that had to be met to, to proceed with the work. Um, the clearing of rubble and the disused fuel tanks, you know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of strange equipment out there. And uh, it's not just vegetation. It is, um, as I've been told, yes, it's been, it's not just that. It's like fuel tanks and stuff left over from the, U.S. base years that has to be handled, and in some cases it has to be handled very carefully. So it's more than just people going down there, coming out there with machetes and weed and weed whackers, with clearing out trees. It's more than that. If it was, we probably would have it done already. Uh, a vegetation is left to do, and the developer is finalizing the footprint so that that work can continue. Um, just some more in information on the solar panel initiatives. Um, we can get exact numbers, but we have paid out about eight rebates for, uh, at varying amounts for the total of about 22 megawatts, as I stated in my statement so far. And there is an additional 90 megawatts in the pipeline. And we expect to honor those applicants' payments over the next few months. Uh, I think that's most of the answers that I have. I'm sure if there are any other questions, members will. If I have an answer, you'll repeat them. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Is there anyone else who would like to speak to head number 89, Department of Energy? I recognize the former Premier, the Honorable Craig Cannonier. I'm the opposition leader, man. <laughs> uh, yeah, in, in the vein, uh, this has been quite interesting um, and informative, actually. Um, in the vein of uh, B324, where he mentioned um, the goal being uh, uh, is, is a low carbon future. Um, and I'll declare my interest. I, I, I am in the fuel industry, but I was just curious as to whether or not there's some exciting things that is happening around energy uh, worldwide, and uh, the, the industry uh, uh, leaders like the Chevrons and the Exxon Mobiles of the, of the world are making some great strides um, in alternative type energies themselves. I was just curious as to whether or not, I know that um, we, uh, the, the department head will uh, allow people to come with new ideas to them, but maybe uh, even as a suggestion, has the department, uh, uh, the head, decided to also go to some of the um, these larger interest groups uh, to find out what some of the latest uh, latest <coughs> technologies are, so that uh, maybe we, as a government uh, in an island, can take advantage of some of these opportunities, as opposed to just waiting for uh, the private sector. Um, I know that uh, for myself, I've been approached many times to put in the uh, electric nodes uh, at the gas stations I have, um, and whether or not government would even consider uh, incentives to allow the uh, service, local service stations um, 
to start putting them in to encourage people to charge up, free of charge, of course, uh, but maybe find some way of incentivizing that where people, uh, when they come, they can, uh, they, they can spend time uh, with that. So it's a two-part question there, sorry. Recognize the Honourable Member, Jean Atherton. Sorry, Mr. S Mr. Chairman. I just had one question to you, and this, this is relating to, I guess, if you look at the performance measures, I'm mindful of the fact that on head, um, on B324, it says that the Department's objective is to um, provide technical and administrative support to the Broadcasting and Telecommunications Commission. And I know that um, we've had a lot, we've talked a lot about telecommunications and we've talked a lot about energy, but I just wondered whether there is, one, any um, performance measures with respect to the broadcasting, and two, um, what type of information does the ministry put out with respect to making the public understand what the Broadcasting Commission does and how it regulates um, content. Thank you. Before um, the Minister answers that question, I'd like to put before the House whether they'd be interested in doing the 23 minutes, because that's all we have left, to about 10 to 1, or do you wish to break for lunch and come back and do 23 minutes after lunch? It's up to the House. Well. Mr. Uh, Chair, can I say, I believe there are Women's Day activities at lunchtime that many members of this House desire to attend, so it will be best that we break for lunch, and I'm happy to come back and continue to answer it. That's time. fine. So uh, I think you have some questions, Minister, to be answered. Yes. Uh, I'm actually quite pleased to hear the comments, Mr. D uh, Chairman, of the Honorable Opposition Leader around, uh, obviously, he has an interest in the fuel um, industry and his comments in relation to the two pieces. One, um, about getting involved with some of the bigger industry players, because it's very obvious if you are paying any attention to what's happening globally that there's more investment by even the big oil companies in renewables. They're putting more money into At, at, at one point, they pulled the money out, but the momentum has mm -hmm. moved so quickly globally in that most of the money going into and even the jobs being created in the energy industry, new jobs are actually in the renewable side. They are not on the side yes. of the fossil fuel. That's yes. where the new growth is going in energy. So, and this is a global trend. Europe has decided that it's moving away, um, is moving to electric cars by 2040. Uh, so, and other parts of, and other progressive countries are actually making aggressive targets to moving to alternative fuels. So, when it comes to the issue of the fuel, um, the electric charges, you note that at the hospital there are charges. Actually, the government has lowered, or I believe it's zero duty, on the importation of electric charge stations now. And yes, we would love to discuss with um, um, fuel stations if they desire to install charging at their stations. The government, can we can discuss an arrangement that will be mutually beneficial, okay. but we're happy to do that. Um, so I hope that those two answers are fluent and that the Rocky Mount Institute is, the, is going to be our guide as we, what we decide to do, even how we may interact with the larger fuel companies around the initiative they're doing, because perhaps there are country-level initiatives that we can look at them. Certainly Rubis and even so have been very supportive in our work um, around these areas. So there will be opportunities in the future, which I will certainly make sure reported to the House. The, um, the other question concerning um, um, telecommunications and the Broadcasting Commission, we can make sure that there's more information. Um, thankfully, the Chairman of the Broadcasting and Telecommunications is a member of this House, the Honorable Michael Scott, and I'm sure he will be happy to spend some time providing further public information as to the work of his commission has in the area of content. Honorable uh, Member, I think with it's that, time yes, of course. For um, lunch, um, um, as I am already standing, Mr. Chairman, <laughs> I can certainly uh, move that we adjourn for lunch until 2 p.m. Thank you.